U.S. imperialism is the number one enemy of humanity. <laughs> che Guevara said that. There will never be freedom until the imperialist is stripped of his power. That was Huey P. Newton, the founder of the Black Panther Party. <laughs> Since our party's founding, in everything we do, the fight against imperialism has been central to our work, and we have always stood in solidarity with anyone around the world, no matter their banner, who is fighting for imperial against imperialism and for national liberation. From Latin America and the Caribbean to Africa and East Asia to the Arab and Islamic world. That includes the fight against the racist oppression of black and Latino and native people in this country, which is also a form of imperialism. When we look at events in the world, like Syria, we look at it through the prism of imperialism. In every struggle we're involved in here, in one form or another, we always try to tie it to the fight against imperialism. But the word imperialism is, is generally misunderstood or used as sort of a curse word or um, it's, uh, what is this, so what is imperialism? Why is the fight against it so critical for the working class and oppressed people inside the United States and so critical for the huge class struggles breaking out now in Spain and in Greece? Which let's hail that tonight. The man who wrote the book on imperialism, so to speak, literally and figuratively, and who also led the first revolution against imperialism, Lenin, I wish I'd brought a copy up here with it, who wrote Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, <laughs> um, if there is one point he was trying to make, it's this in that book, imperialism is not a policy. A policy is a choice a voluntary course of action by the policymaker, which can be changed at will. Imperialism is not driven by belief or ideology. The imperialist invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan were not blunders or miscalculations by right-wing politicians following a neocon agenda, as some left liberals say. Nor it is a conspiracy, although imperialism does give birth to many conspiracies. It's not driven by a desire to dominate, a thirst for adventure, or even by greed. It is not about obtaining resources such as oil. Were it that, the United States would have bought oil from Iraq rather than starving the Iraqi people for 10 years with sanctions. It would be buying oil from the Islamic Republic of Iran right now rather than trying to strangle it. I want to return to the question of oil later. And, but that shows also why this line about energy independence that the Democrats are pushing now, if the U.S. could be energy independent, there'd be no uh, imperialist wars in the Middle East. Well, that's, that's silly. That's ridiculous. But Lenin found it necessary to, to polemicize against all these ideas in his time. At the time, they were, their leading exponent was a guy named Karl Kautsky. Um, because he felt it was necessary to defeat our enemy, it's necessary to understand it. Imper imperialism, as Lenin used the term, was, a, was a, as a scientific term for the transformation of the capitalist system that happened in the late 19th century. This transformation came in tandem with the global capitalist crisis of 1873 called the Long Depression that Comrade Fred Goldstein wrote about in July, and on the heels of the Second Industrial Revolution. It is the ultimate stage, the final, most parasitic phase of the social system we call capitalism. Simply and precisely, imperialism is the rule of the banks. In the United States, that means Wall Street, including Wall Street South. We also call it monopoly capitalism, which is maybe an easier term to understand. But there's a reason Lenin thought the term imperialism is important, because it emphasizes the primary effect of monopoly of capitalism for the majority of humanity, the division of the world into oppressed and oppressor nations, into exploiter and exploited nations, and that the oppressed countries of the world of Africa and Asia and Latin America have become the primary source of profit for the banks and corporations, and that's where their power rests. While, while capitalism in Europe 
played a revolutionary role for a period of time by developing the means of production and uh, mass commodity manufacturing, machine production, which is a tremendous step forward, and all that made possible. When it came to Asia and Africa and Latin America on the bayonets of Euro European armies, it played just the opposite effect. It strangled development. It crushed it. Even capitalist development, it blocked the way. And that's why uh, even struggles for bourgeois democracy were crushed by Western guns. So it's why, the Le why Lenin changed, and it's why Lenin changed the slogan of the Communist International, from workers of the world unite to workers and oppressed peoples of the world unite. In recognition of this global contradiction and that the working class and the oppressor nations, like here, could not fight the growing colossus of monopoly capital without solidarity and unity with people around the world oppressed by imperialism. Imp Imperialism is the stage of capitalist development, or rather decay, when merger after merger has stamped out so-called free competition. Giant banks have merged with industrial corporations to create what Lenin called finance capital, when all major branches of industry, oil, auto, electronics, communications, retail stores, movies, are dominated by a few giant corporate monopolies who have swallowed up their competitors. In the U.S., 300 Auto companies became the big three, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, and Chrysler's now uh, merged with Daimler-Benz. The, uh, the oil companies, there were many. Now, uh, when, I, when I was young, they were called the Seven Sisters, or we call them the Seven Brothers, but they were seven big oil monopolies. Now who's left at the top? ExxonMobil, Chevron Texaco. ExxonMobil is a merger of two huge ones, Chevron Texaco, British Petroleum, which is half U.S. owned anyway, by the way. Uh, similar competing monopolies exist in other capitalist countries. A recent Swiss study found that 147 corporations control more than 40 percent of the world's production. But these corporations themselves are under the control or even created by a few big banks who really own the economy of the United States and much of the world. In the U.S. today, there are four banks with assets of over $1 trillion. Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, which is itself a merger of the banking houses of Morgan and Rockefeller, Citigroup and Wells Fargo. That have, they have assets of over a $1 trillion, and six banks own more than 40% of the U.S. gross domestic uh, uh, product. Sorry. And no, the Rothschilds are not among them. <laughs> they control small companies, too. Remember the Republic windows and doors strike in Chicago when, uh, work, when workers seized a plant to stop it being closed down? It was a small plant, 500 workers, but it turned out the Bank of America was calling the shots. That was who they were fighting. And behind these banks are the same as some of the same big financial dynasties, Rockefeller, Morgan, DuPont, Mellon, that Ferdinand Lundberg wrote about 75 years ago in America's 60 Families. Some new ones have emerged, others have fallen by the wayside, but in this game, even fabulously wealthy individuals like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Michael Bloomberg are just small fry. They're too so poor they have to have their money in their own name. If you look at the boards of directors of the biggest corporations, you will see many of the same people and certainly see representatives of the same big financial institutions, the same inter they're called interlocking directorates. You'll see the same uh, interests on the, uh, represented on the boards of universities and hospitals, and you'll see them represented in the appointed cabinet of any president. Giant banks and corporations, often the same banks and corporations, fund both parties, Republican and Democrat, and it's they who run the country, not the elected officials who are their servants. They put prospective politicians through school, and when politicians and generals retire, if they've done a good job for their sponsors, they will get much better paying jobs for the corporations. Look at how Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld and Dick Schultz flitted back and forth between the government and corporate positions, and you'll see the same thing in democratic administrations. But rich and powerful as these scumbags are, they have a master, and that master is capital itself, the vast accumulation of stolen wealth of surplus value, of stolen labor that Karl Marx called dead labor that lives in you, vampire-like, 
by sucking the blood of the living. And by the way, in Marx's time, nobody had seen like hot young vampires like in Twilight Saga. We're talking like Max Schreck vampires. Like, you know, it's really <laughs> ugly. Um, um, uh, capital is a monster that cannot remain idle, but must, it has one law, it must always be reinvested at an equal or higher rate of profit. The richest bankers and owners of capital cannot escape the iron law of their system, expand or die. They cannot escape the crisis that is unique to the capitalist system, the very crisis that monopolies were formed to prevent or stave off. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, writing in the Communist Manifesto in 1848, called it that epidemic that in all earlier epics would have seemed an absurdity, the epic of overproduction. The crisis of too much. Too much what? In the 19th century, they were talking about manufactured commodities. In the time, too many text, cotton textiles or sugar sweated out of the slave laborers on the plantations in the Caribbean or uh, sewing machines or steam engines. Later, cars, airplanes, all these things. More than produced than the capitalists could sell at a profit. For the oil companies, it's too much oil. And how does the bourgeoisie get over these crises, Marx asks? On the one hand, by enforced destruction of a mass of productive forces. On the other hand, by the conquest of new markets and by the more thorough exploitation of the old ones. That is uh, by, to say, by paving the way for more extensive and destructive crises and by diminishing the means whereby crises are prevented. Monopolies, called trust in the US, cartels in Germany, came into being in the late 19th century to get over these crises, to stamp out overproduction by stamping out competition, by rigging prices and restricting supply, to protect the capitalist profits from the falling prices that inevi inevitably follow the cheapening of the means of production. Restricting production is what monopoly is all about, whether it was Rockefeller, Standard Oil goons blowing up their competitors' refineries in the, in the oil wars of 1870 or uh, in Pennsylvania, or whether it's the uh, ExxonMobil's goons today, the U.S. Army and Navy destroying Iraq's nationalized oil industry so ExxonMobil can increase its, mar its market share. Then the first monopoly capitalists, though, back then, the Rockefellers, Mellons, Morgans, they made fantastic profits at the time, but it didn't solve their problem. It only added to it because all these fantastic profits had to be reinvested and to the, at an equal or greater profit. It cannot remain idle, otherwise the rate of profit goes down and therefore added to the crisis of where to sell their commodities, they had, they had a crisis of where to put their money. A crisis of too much money while millions starved. That was the, that was the, it's that, the driving need to reinvest capital at a higher rate of profit that's the driving force of imperialism and that is behind every war that's been fought for the last century. Hundreds of millions killed, trillions of dollars wasted, all because the capitalists have too much money. I became, in other words, we, the working class, and that means the working class of the entire world has produced too much. I became politically active in 1968 during the war against Vietnam. The U.S. had sent half a million troops to that land in Southeast Asia and rained it with more bombs than fell on all of Europe during World War II. White phosphorus, carpet bombing, napalm, all in the name of fighting communism. If we don't stop them there, Chinese troops will be marching down Broadway. We heard stuff like that. Right, okay. <laughs> they actually said stuff like that. It was the pretext for invading the Dominican Republic, too, in 1965, stopping communism or, the, or, the, or for the uh, CIA-sponsored campaign of terrorism against revolutionary Cuba. Stopping communism was the reason they used in Korea 15 years earlier, earlier, when the U.S. dropped so many bombs on North Korea, the socialist North, that not a single building was left standing where the capital city of Pyongyang, with 400,000 people, was hit with 420,500 pound bombs. Three million people died. And both the Vietnam War and the Korean War were started by Democratic administrations and intensified by Republican ones. No doubt the corporate politicians and banker generals hate communism. But the United States first invaded Cuba and Puerto Rico in 1898. That was 25 years before Fidel Castro was born. 
The same year, the U.S. launched a genocidal campaign against the Filipino people who were fighting for independence and, annexed, and also annexed Hawaii and Guam and Samoa. That was before communism existed as an organized party anywhere in Asia or Latin America. In our history books, we read about the Spanish-American War. How many people in this country know about the real war, the Philippine-American War, from 1898 to 1902, and that the U.S. Army murdered hundreds of thousands of Filipino children, women, and men using methods they had perfected against native people in this country? How many know that hundreds of black soldiers deserted during that war and that fun, some fought alongside the Filipino insurrectos, the freedom fighters, against the racist U.S. Army? As I said, these wars and invasions were launched decades before any Communist Party existed in those parts of the world. In 1900, U.S., German, British, French, and Japanese troops burned and looted Beijing in China, the capital of China. Mao Zedong was only nine years old. The first U.S. military massacres of Muslims also took place in the Philippines during that war in the southern island of Mindanao. That was six de decades before Osama bin Laden was born. These wars were, named, were waged in the name of Manifest Destiny, but its most loud-mouthed exponents, like Senator Albert, Albert, Albert Beveridge, I urge people to read, I mean, not urge people, but you can read his speech, uh, March of the Flag, where he said, he, it was, they, were, they were talking about Manifest Destiny, the U.S.'s divine mission. But he said, today we are raising more than we can consume, making more than we can use. Therefore, we must find new markets for our produce. This was a demagogic appeal to U.S. workers because Beveridge and President McKinley knew full well that what they were capturing were markets for capital investment. That was primarily why they were in those countries, to, uh, to, to open up sugar plantations and uh, other forms of, uh, force of uh, exploitation of the workers there, not to, not to uh, open up commodity markets. Lieutenant General Smedley Butler a two-time Medal of Honor winner described U.S. actions of the time more accurately. He said, the trouble with America is that when the dollar only earns 6% over here, then it gets restless and goes overseas and gets 100%. Then the flag follows the dollar and the soldiers follow the flag. I spent 33 years and four months in active military service as a member of this country's most agile military force, the Marine Corps. I served in all commissioned ranks from second lieutenant to major general, and during that time I spent most of my time being a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, for the bankers. I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico, especially Tampico, safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the banking house of Brown Brothers in 1909. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests in 1916. I, in China, I helped, it to see, I helped to see to it that Standard Oil went its way unmolested. The U.S. eruption onto the world stage in 1898 came on the heels of the great economic crisis called the Long Depression. It also came on the heels of the final genocide against the native people of the Plains, the crushing of the Plains nations, and the massacre at Wounded Knee, of the overthrow of Reconstruction in the South, of the black Reconstruction governments, especially in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1892, and the hanging of the Haymarket martyrs and the crushing of the eight-hour-a-day movement. And it came in tandem with the rise of the giant monopolies called trusts. It was opposed by something called the Anti-Imperialist League, which was led by Mark Twain, who openly supported the Filipino freedom fighters and the so-called boxers in China who were fighting against the U.S. Army. That league was a mass movement. The founding convention had 10,000 delegates. Its social base was much the same as the Populist Party. Small farmers and businessmen, even some industrial capitalists who were being crushed by the big banks. It was the last gasp of an independent middle class that, had been the, that in the North had been the social basis for the war against slavery. It was the consolidation of the power of Wall Street over industry and was clearly uh, seen that way at the time. If you read what the populists said, it sounds a lot like what Occupy Wall Street folks say today. 
The same process was happening in West Europe and Japan at the same time. The rise of finance capital sent Britain, France, Germany, and Belgium on a mad race to colonize Africa. It was called the scramble for Africa, and the crimes they committed there were equal to anything that Adolf Hitler did half a century later. Woodrow Wilson and the war to end, oh, sorry, and, and they carved it up. <laughs> they carved it, sorry. Um, and millions died of famine during that period in those countries as they changed over the, 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 the economies in Africa and Asia to one crop uh, economies. The big Western powers met in Berlin in 1890-85 to divide up Africa, decide who would get which part. France and, and, and uh, uh, Britain got the lion's share, but they cut in Germany to, for peace between them. Germany got Tanganyika and Uganda and Togo. But the deal didn't last because 30 years later, 20 million died in the First World War. The first war between imperialist powers. And the war was over what Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, was said this war is because England wa owns the earth and Germany wants a piece of it. This was the same... Um, Woodrow Wilson was elected in 1916, was re-elected as the peace candidate. He kept us out of World War I. Five years earlier, as governor of New Jersey, Wilson had said, the great monopoly in this country is the money monopoly, the monopoly of big credits. A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. Our system of credit is privately concentrated. The growth of the nation, therefore, and all our activities are in the hands of a few men. Trouble was, those few men had financed his campaign to office. <laughs> and First National City Bank, which was one of his big backers, had loaned France and Britain millions of dollars to buy arms from the US for the war. If Germany and Austria won the war, First National City might lose its investment, might not get paid. So shortly after his re-election, Wilson changed his tune and sent a million US soldiers to France to end all wars and keep the world safe for democracy. The war to end all wars is what they call, he called that war. And uh, it, it ended with the Versailles Treaty, which carved up the old Ottoman Empire, the so-called Middle East, Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, uh, Iraq, between Britain and France. And it was the beginning of the Zionist colonization of, of Palestine. And uh, one writer wrote a clever book called uh, The Peace to End All Peace. <laughs> World War II, the, this redivision didn't last. World War II. 40 years, 25, 23 years later. People remember it as the good war because uh, the, U the United States was allied with the Soviet Union and with revolutionary partisan uh, movements against a truly reprehensible enemy. But for Germany, Britain, France, and the US, while the, Uni while the Soviet Union and the East Europe took the brunt of the war in, in Europe and China took the brunt of it in, in Asia, uh, and 60 million died, nearly half in the USSR, but uh, that war was the best thing ever for Wall Street. Huge military contracts gave birth to the military industrial complex, but that was gravy. The global destruction of that war left the world in debt to the United States and the US with nearly half of the, of the industrial, world's industrial productive capacity. Anything you wanted to buy, you had to buy it from a US company, and you had to borrow the money from a US bank to buy it, except in the socialist countries, and that's a, another issue. But it wasn't enough. A few years, the war was barely over when the United States turned on its allies, the Soviet Union and the revolutionary partisan movements who they massacred in Greece and the Philippines. They started the Cold War. This time, uh, which was uh, not so cold in most of the world, it was a war against socialism and national liberation. In Korea, they murdered three million, the war in Vietnam, but between those and those wars accompanied uh, a sea of bloody covert operations in Guatemala, in Cuba, in Iraq, in Indonesia, where they killed a million people in 1965 in a CIA-orchestrated coup. Central America, where hundreds of thousands died. And most of these covert operations in the Congo, where they murdered Patrice Lumumba, and most of these covert operations can be clearly, um, the beneficiaries are pretty clear. United Fruit in Guatemala, uh, Gulf oil, when the, when, when, the, when the CIA put the Shah of Iran back on his throne in 1953. Um, Gulf oil was cut into the Iranian oil market. It was all, been, all been British before. And um, Kermit Roosevelt, who organized the coup, got a job for, uh, as a vice president at Gulf oil. Um, 
the co and uh, massive military spending and a huge military industrial complex. Uh, Ramsey Clark called the Cold War the biggest crime against humanity just by the amount of waste involved. Twenty years ago, the United States won the Cold War. The Soviet Union fell, which is the topic for another dis discussion. And it was, uh, it opened up a, uh, the, the Wall Street bankers had not been so happy since the end of World War II. Uh, it opened up uh, huge new markets. Uh, it doubled the labor force available to exploitation by, by the capitalist class. It, um, the dollar soared in value as um, the U.S. dollar became, as it became the de facto currency in East Europe and the Soviet Union, the U.S. share of world production uh, rose for the first time since the 40s, since the early 50s. They called it the longest peace, peacetime expansion ever, but it wasn't, uh, it was based on uh, destruction, destruction in the form of socialist camp where unemployment rose, where life expectancies fell, where whole industries were shut down. But still, it wasn't enough. We heard about a peace dividend back then, that all the money didn't spend on war would go to human needs. Where is it? What have we had since then? We've had, uh, um, we've, seen, we've seen the wars in Iraq, Yugoslavia, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq again. We've seen um, the, the bombing of Libya, the, this massive covert operation going on now in Syria. We see war threats against Iran. We see um, in this good cop, bad cop routine that uh, the U.S. and Israel are playing. And just yesterday we see uh, Russia, capitalist Russia. Russia's now capitalist. What more do they want? They're ringing it with missiles. We have AFRICOM, the Africa Command is NATO and, and the U.S. military expand into Africa. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is operating in Afghanistan. Drone attacks in Pakistan and Somalia. Just yesterday, uh, Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister of, the so of the Russia, warned of a new, uh, that the Arab Spring may turn into a nuclear winter. The basic point of this, I'll wrap up now though, is this. They, this a hundred, uh, a century and more of, that, of, of imperialism shows, they have no choice. They're, and however irrational or crazy, some might say a war on Iran, on Iran would be, now, now, by the way, Obama's ordered a shift to the Pacific. They say we've got to get tough on China. China, their biggest market, <laughs> it's opened its, its, its gates to, to, to Western capital. But here's the problem. This victory intensified their contradictions. It didn't alleviate them. Why? Because this huge new resources of labor are available to anybody. Any capitalist company from Japan, from Europe, from the U.S., even Russian capitalist companies can go in and exploit those workers. It doesn't give the U.S. an advantage. It's like when they introduce a new labor-saving device and that becomes generalized. It, uh, it, it gives them no competitive advantage over anybody else. So they have to take that advantage by force. So we're going to see war after war and, and even they're turning in on themselves. When you see the talk about privatization and attacking the post office and public schools and, and privatizing them, that's imperialism and its driving force is the fact that they have $23 trillion sitting in the banks they have nowhere to invest. This problem crisis cannot be solved under this system. They will move on from war to war, whether a Democrat or Republican is in the White House, unless they are stopped. They have no choice, and we have no choice, and the only choice we have is to build a revolutionary movement that can take their power, because they have to be abolished as a class. Their wealth has to be expropriated and taken out of their hands, and their state power has to be smashed. We have to march in protest against their wars. We have to link those struggles, like on October 7th, on uh, a week from uh, Sunday. We have to link those struggles to the fight at home, for jobs and housing and schools and against layoffs and against racism most of all. But all of this work must be done with a view in mind that this, the same view that Lenin had in 1916 when he said turn the, in 1918, when he said, turn the imperialist war into a civil war. It has to be the view of overthrowing their system and overthrowing their class. Thank you.